Life is full of expectations, and many times those expectations turn out to be a wonderful experience. They're exactly what you thought they would be, right? You have these expectations, they're fulfilled, and it's just a beautiful thing, like a vacation that goes just like you planned, or a new job that's really what you wanted, or a new friendship is just really something you had prayed for. And it's a wonderful thing when our expectations are actually fulfilled, but there are other times we just get it wrong and we find ourselves disappointed. You thought something would turn out one way and it went the total opposite way, a sporting event that ended with a favored team getting whooped. I'm not going to mention any specific Patriots, any specific teams today. Or if you're a state fan, I won't mention any specific Cardinals uh, if you watched the game last Tuesday. But uh, with the Bulldogs whooping the Cardinals. But uh, I digress. And, And your team gets beat or the team you thought would win didn't. The team you thought would lose, the underdog. Now, well, that was unexpected, right? Or you go on vacation somewhere and everyone, everything about the destination falls way short of the travel brochures. You ever been there? <laughs> yeah, Coco's got it. And you think, maybe we should have had a staycation instead of a vacation. You all know staycations, right? You've, yeah, okay. Or maybe you're just trying to do something as simple as go somewhere for an event, but you've never been there and you get lost. Your expectations were pretty clear. You thought the GPS knew what it was talking about, but you get lost. Maybe you've been there, like this guy who plays the bagpipes. I'll tell you his story. He says, as a bagpiper, I play many gigs. Recently, I was asked by a funeral director to play at a graveside service for a homeless man. He had no family, no friends. So the service was to be at a pauper's cemetery in the Kentucky backcountry. As I was not familiar with the backwoods, I got lost, and being a typical male, I did not stop for directions. I finally arrived an hour late and saw the funeral guy had evidently gone, and the hearse was nowhere in sight. There were only some diggers, and the crew left, and they were eating lunch. I felt badly, and I apologized to the men for being late, and I quickly went to the graveside and looked down at the vault lid. Looked down, and the vault lid was already in place. I didn't know what else to do, so I just started to play. The workers put down their lunches and began to gather around me. I played out my heart and soul for this man with no family and friends, and as I played Amazing Grace, the workers began to weep. They wept. I wept. We all wept together. When I finished, I packed up my bagpipes and started for my car. Though my my head hung low, my heart was full. As I opened the door to my car, I heard one of the workers say, I've never seen nothing like this before, and I've been putting in septic tanks for 20 years. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't the right place. And so he concluded, he says, I think I'm still lost. It's not quite what he expected out of a reverent uh, ceremony. On the first day of the final week of Jesus' earthly ministry, he was surrounded by throngs of people, and many of whom had great expectations of who he was and what he was going to do. Some were looking forward to all that he would do for them. Others were looking forward to getting rid of him and everywhere in between. Somewhere in the crowd, I believe, we will find each of us. At times, welcoming his arrival, and at other times, thinking we must have gotten it wrong, with our expectations being disappointed. And we might even question, at times, his heart for us, his watch care over us, thinking that he's asleep at the switch, that that he's too busy taking care of other problems in the world to care and to pay attention to us. You ever been there? Maybe you're there this morning. All of us have been there at some point, and if not, we will find ourselves there. Life has disappointment. We, in our nature, have expectations, and we put ourselves out there. We put our hearts out there. But God. 
so often I find myself having to remember, and, and God, by His grace, brings scriptures to memory that He is God and I'm not, that He's in control. And not only is in control, but it's that his heart for me is governing my life. And that gives me even more comfort than the fact that he's in control. I mean, we can easily, I think, give mental assent and and discussion to the fact that he is in control. He's God. (laughs) But I think it's a harder move to go over to his heart and our heart and his heart for us that he really does care and he's not lost sight of us, that he really does know what he's doing. He really has our lives in his plans. You think about Job and all that he went through. And he never gave up knowing God's heart for him. He questioned God's decisions. He looked at his own life. His friends were convinced that he was in sin because of all the trouble he went through. But he held to his integrity Everything that Job went through, here's the point, was father filtered. Satan did all those things to Job's family, to his wealth, to his house, to everything, to his health. He lost everything. But it was Satan who approached God and said, let me touch him. Let me do this. I'll show you that he's not faithful to you. I'll show you. He'll give up on you. But he didn't. And the point for us, again, is that everything that came into Job's life first had to pass through the Father's faithful, loving, all-knowing, all-loving hand first. And it's the same for us. I believe that's why Job is in the Bible. So that we can understand that if it's God allowing circumstances or the devil bringing something into our lives, guys, It's not our job to rebuke the devil. It's our job to go to the Father and to fall on Him and to trust Him that if He's doing something and allowing something in our lives, it is for our good. All things work together for good. And specifically, Romans 8, 28 says, God causes all things to work together for the good that those who love Him, those who are called according to His what? His purpose. Not our purpose. His purpose. And so... It's a hard, that's a hard transition to make because life doesn't always turn out the right way. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't go the way we thought it would, again, like, like those in the throngs and the crowds. At this time in Jerusalem, uh, this time of Passover, Jerusalem, which normally had 600,000 people living there and in the outer areas, had swollen to over 2 million people, this being one of the three mandatory celebrations and feasts of the year, Passover. Millions of people, people everywhere, people on people, just everywhere. And this is the time that Jesus, although in, prior to his having um, been so discreet and so under the radar with his ministry, when someone would say, I'm going to go tell everybody. No, don't tell anybody. How many times did he say that? He's, somebody's healed. Somebody's brought back to life. Somebody is, is just given sight. And, like, I, I don't, and, and of course, they ended up telling so many people. But he, he again, they, they, they so often, the crowds would want to push him to be king. He said, no, no. He would walk right through him and go on off somewhere to pray. His time had not come. Yet now he's saying, all right, it's time. And something very special as we look at Palm Sunday and the events of that day in Luke 19, something very special was that he orchestrated these events. And when they acknowledged him as king, he didn't say, no, 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 not yet. He said, that's right. It's finally time. And there's something very specific we'll see in our text today about this day that, uh, in history as he came into Jerusalem. This is, this is the account of Palm Sunday, the first day of Holy Week, as they call it, called the Triumphal Entry. It is, it is accounted in all four of the Gospels. Um, and in each case, they are referring back to Psalm 118, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, uh, acknowledging he is Messiah. And so with that, let's look at it together, and then we'll look at it closely and see how it can uh, impact our lives. And let's pick it up in verse 28 of Luke 19. 
And after he had said these things, he was going on ascending to Jerusalem. Now, but let's pause there. After he had said what things? <laughs> We're breaking this up in the middle of a chapter, right? Jesus had just told the parable of the master who went away and had come back to check on the faithfulness of his servants. And so on the heels of that being a parable of Israel, faithless Israel, who overlooked the Messiah when he was right there in front of them, on the heels of that, he makes his entry into Jerusalem. And then it says, he, after these things, he ascended to Jerusalem. He was around Jericho previously to this, and he ascends to Jerusalem. Jericho is about 800 uh, feet below sea level. Jerusalem, about 2,500 feet above sea level. So ascending, though he was going north, didn't, uh, though he was going south, uh, don't get the impression he was ascending, meaning he was going north. He's actually going uphill, uh, about 20 miles. And uh, so a gradual climb, but a climb nonetheless. And... Um, the, 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 with Jerusalem being at such a high altitude, those who would, uh, in the Psalm 118, for example, it's called the Song of Ascents, or the Song of Ascension, where uh, it would be sung, those songs, while they're ascending and walking to Jerusalem for the festivals. Interesting that he is doing that right now. Perhaps they're singing while they're going. And it came about that when he approached Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, which, in which as you enter you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Thus you shall speak. The Lord has need of it. And those who were sent went away and found it just as he told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they said, oh, oh okay. <laughs> and they brought it to Jesus. And they threw their garments on the colt and put Jesus on it. And as he was going, they were spreading their garments on the road. And also we learn from the other Gospels and palm branches. Of course, Palm Sunday is where we get that, right? And as he was now approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen. Why did they praise him? For all the miracles which they had seen. And they said, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees and the multitude said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and said to them, I tell you, if these stones, if these people become silent, these stones will cry out. And when he approached he saw the city and wept over it. And that weeping there is convulsive crying. And he said, if you had known in, make a note of that phrase, this day, this day, and we'll come back to that. Even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days shall come upon you when your enemies will throw up a bank before you and surround you and hem you in on every side and will level you to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation and that's where we'll pause for today the time of your visitation so he comes in he's approaching here during passover with his followers again the city has has swollen more than a million and a half more people ready for the big passover celebration and the passover lamb is coming in right before them Mounted on a donkey. And interestingly, when a, a king or a mighty warrior leader would enter the city after a victory, he would ride a stallion. And they would throw down palm branches. So the crowd got the palm branches right. That, so that's saying, hey, this is a declaration of victory. But they missed the part because he was writing something that symbolized a prince of peace. Someone coming in peace, not in war, and not on the heels of war. But that's how he came his first time. His first advent from the cradle to the cross was about peace, was about suffering, 
was about him becoming the one who would make peace between us and Almighty and Holy God. In Revelation, you see him coming as a mighty warrior on a stallion, declaring his victory over hell and death once and for all. No more hell, no more death, no more, well, no more death. <laughs> and bringing his people into his presence, an amazing picture of what we have to look forward to. But this Advent, this arrival was much more humble. He said, go into the village opposite you in which you enter and find a colt, which no one has ever sat. He rode this relatively humble animal into Jerusalem. He didn't come as a conquering general. He came as a humble servant. Zechariah's prophecy saw Messiah as the prince of peace. He says he, he will come gentle, mounted on a donkey, on a colt even, specifically it says. So he's fulfilling the prophecy here of what he, Jesus did and who he is. The entry into Jerusalem has been turned the triumph of Christ, right? The triumphal entry. Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry, right? It was a triumph, but it was a triumph over, of, of humility over pride and worldly grandeur. That was the triumph. It was the triumph of humility over pride. It was the triumph of poverty over affluence. It was the triumph of meekness and gentleness over rage and revenge. This is a different kind of king coming in and saying, I am establishing a different kind of kingdom. And the kingdom that he established then continues to reign in our hearts to this day. It's the Prince of Peace reigning in us and letting others see the peace that He is to bring in relationships and in the world, in every aspect of culture and society. A very different kind of king. I love how when he, the, the disciples approach the man who owned the cult, he says, uh, Jesus, the, it says the Lord needs it. Oh, okay. And they just say, okay. And that's His sovereignty, even over that man's decision. He didn't say who. He didn't ask. He didn't inquire. He just said, okay, you got it. And he went on. And they come and they bring garments, verse 36, and palm branches, we learn from other gospels, and lay them in his path. Again, a symbol of the palm branches being a symbol of his victory. But then they come to this part and they say, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. This was a very clear declaration of his deity, of his messiahship, that the Messiah has come, that he has arrived on the scene. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They all knew that was a messianic psalm. In fact, in, um, in Mark and in John, it says, blessed here, or rather here, and in John, it says, blessed is the king who comes. In Luke, Matthew, and Mark, it says, blessed is he. So again, the, blessed is the king. The king is here. They knew that wasn't just some random title. That was them saying, this is Messiah, and he's on the scene. And some of the Pharisees, that's why they react this way. In verse 39, they said, teacher, that's the most respect they could come up with, <laughs> Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Teacher, rebuke your disciples. The crowd's praise made Jesus' enemies very uncomfortable. It made them object to the praise being offered. It made them know that they were being defeated. John 12, 19 says that on this day, the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Nothing tells Satan and his followers that they have lost like the praises of God ringing in their ears. Satan loses because when God's people are really worshiping, their hearts and minds are on him and not on sin, not on self or on Satan's distractions. That's the beautiful thing about worship. It helps us to transcend the things of this world, especially the things in our own minds that distract us and bring us down and to bring us into the presence of God. 
So these religious leaders are not happy, to say the least. And Jesus responds, and he says, I tell you that if these stones should keep silent, the if these, I keep doing that, if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Jesus said this when the Pharisees told him to quiet those who praised him and received him as king. On this day, Jesus was going to be praised. No matter if it was people or rocks. And I really believe that the, the one who spoke everything into existence and the one by whom everything holds together, we see in Colossians, had the people not worshipped, we would have heard creation worship Almighty God in the flesh. For most of his ministry, Jesus did everything he could to discourage people from publicly celebrating him as Messiah. But here, Jesus invites public praise and adoration as Messiah. He's not telling them, no. Someone may challenge you. And they may say, well, Jesus never really said, I am God. Well, yeah, he did. And he said he's Messiah. He used all those phrases interchangeably. I and the Father are one. You know, there's many places you can see that in here for sure. He's not telling them, no, 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 don't worship me as God. He's, he's letting them do it. The idea of creation itself praising God may seem strange. But the Bible actually speaks about that in a few places. Psalm 148, Psalm 96, talk about the trees, the hills, the oceans, the rivers, the mountains, the valleys, the cattle, and the creeping things, the birds, and the fields even, giving praise to God. Yet this day, the stone stayed silent because all the multitude did praise Jesus with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Their praise was filled with what? with memory. They remembered the wonderful things that He had done for them. And, and likewise, does our praise do that? We thank God for all He has done. They remembered all the mighty works they saw Jesus do, such as the raising of Lazarus from the dead. They told of the great things God had done in their lives. Do we do the same? Or is our praise too often just routine? Do we have something specific in our minds that we praise God for? things that we have seen Him do in our lives? Anyone who says praise the Lord should be able to answer the question, praise Him for what? And, and I can tell you, um, I definitely have, seasons, have had seasons in my life where my praise was empty, where my, where my praise was just routine, it was just rote. It wasn't because I wasn't really trusting Him for anything. I wasn't really stepping out in faith. He was, he was allowing things in my life, and I was, I was choosing fear over faith. Yet when we go to battle, and we, we trust the Lord to be our mighty warrior, and He steps in and steps up and shows off, we have a reason to praise Him. When, we're, when we simply reflect on the cross and all that He did there, our salvation that He purchased, there's reason to praise Him. So it could be something recently that He's done. It could be us reflecting on simply all that He has done in saving us. He approached, He saw the city, He weeps over it, convulsively crying, broken. He says, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes, hidden from the eyes of the Jews who had all the prophets pointing to Jesus, all the fulfillments that he walked out every day. If you had known, even you, especially this your day, the things which make for peace. This was a turning point for the Jewish people. Their leaders had rejected Jesus, and most of the people followed the leaders. Yet if they had known Jesus and His work as Messiah, they might have been spared the destruction that was to come, that He speaks of, and all that, that uh, happened in A.D. 70 when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. Jesus here shows the heart of God as He weeps. How even when, listen, even when judgment must be pronounced, it is never done with joy. Did you catch that? Judgment is being pronounced by God Himself in the flesh that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, and He weeps. He doesn't have any sick satisfaction. 
in bringing judgment. It breaks his heart. And again, I think that's a miss on the part of the world, and perhaps on us when we were baby Christians. How can God be so loving, yet so wrathful? Remember, mixed in that wrath, you see right here the heart of God. He's broken to the core. Even when God's judgment is perfectly just, it's fair, it is righteous, his heart weeps at the bringing of the judgment. Jesus mourns over the fact that they did not know the time of the Messiah's coming, the day prophesied by Daniel, the day prophesied by the psalmist in 118. This day was so important because it was unlikely the day, but it, because it was likely, pardon me, the day prophesied by Daniel, the Messiah, the prince, would come to Jerusalem. Daniel said that it would be 483 years on the Jewish calendar from the day of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, the decree of Cyrus, we see way back, to the day the Messiah would come to Jerusalem would be 483 years. There is a scholar named Sir Robert Anderson, and he has looked down at the 360-day year in the Jewish calendar, and he's brought it down to this day. That's why we highlighted this day. Exactly to the day, 483 years, from the decree of Cyrus to the entering of Messiah into Jerusalem, exactly 483 years. Amazing. He even gives a date, actually. He says April 6th. Um, and God is a God of order, but He's also God. <laughs> he knows not only the past, He knows the future, and, and He can do that. He can bring things to pass exactly as He says, exactly when He says. Amazing. It's fulfilled 483 years later to the day. You can write down J Daniel 9.25 as a reference for that. But this day is also mentioned in Psalm 118. This is the day the Lord has made. I want us to look at Psalm 118, if you can turn there with me, because this is amazing what we see here, just the, the prophecy and, and all that's fulfilled right before their eyes. Again, they had this. <laughs> they had the Psalms. They had the Torah. But they were looking for a different kind of king. In Psalm 118, Let's start with verse 19. Open to me the gates of righteousness. Has the Lord done that through Jesus Christ? Absolutely. I shall enter through them. I shall give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous will enter through it. Who is the gate? Jesus said, I am the door. I am the gate to the sheepfold, right? Jesus is the gate. The righteous will enter through it. I will give thanks to thee, for thou hast answered me, and thou hast become my salvation. Watch this. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, do save. We beseech thee. O Lord, we beseech thee. Do send prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. Let's pause there. They remembered that part of the passage. They remembered verse 26. They quoted it. They shouted it. Whether they were remembering it or the Lord just inspired them in the crowd to say that, it's going right back to this prophetic, messianic psalm that points to Messiah, the one who is the gate, the one who is the door, the one who opens the door to the righteous. He is the stone which the builders rejected, but that's where they didn't think back to the verses previous to that. The stone which the builders rejected, not the one who's going to be elevated as king before their very eyes. He has become the chief cornerstone. And then it says, this is the day. Do you see that? This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, do save. And they go, uh, Hosanna. You know where they shout, Hosanna, Hosanna. That means do save, do save, or save now. That's what they're shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. It's right there in verse 25 in Psalm 118. Hosanna, Hosanna, do save, save now. We beseech you, send prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When they said that, that was 100%, no question, Messiah. Blessed is the one, blessed is the king, blessed is the one who arrives on the scene to be our king of kings. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. And then this is where they missed it. Had they gone back to that, maybe again, inspired by somebody in the crowd who knew the word, 
and who shouted and got the rest of the crowd. You know how, something, how a chant starts in a crowd sometimes? One person starts and everybody, all of a sudden everybody's shouting it. Perhaps it was that. If they had gone to Psalm 118, they would have seen something here in verse 27. Did you see it? The Lord is God. And he has given us light. Bind the festival sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. Wait a minute, that's a twist. That was unexpected. You are my God, and I give thanks to you. You are my God, I extol you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. The Lord ordained, he put in there that this king is going to be bound as the sacrifice to the altar the perfect sacrifice. And just as Abraham raised up his knife to slay his son Isaac, so we deserved that death blow. We are Isaac. As he is pulled off that and the ram in the thicket comes and as the sacrifice, so Jesus took our place as our sacrifice. And just as they then had great expectations that were disappointed because they were looking for the wrong king. They were looking for one that would not be dressed like he dressed, wouldn't talk like he talked. He didn't play the games. He didn't uh, echo the teachings of the rabbis. He confronted them, calling them child of, children of Satan. <laughs> Pretty, pretty opposite from what they were expecting. We also can come to the Lord with expectations. And, and if our heart or our minds have gotten away from the truth of the Word of God and His character and His nature, then we're going to be disappointed when He does things we don't expect. But if we're holding fast to Him, we'll have joy. So in this crowd, we see three very different responses to the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. So if you're taking notes, here are the three different responses to Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. And somewhere in the crowd, I believe we will even see ourselves first. The first type of person we see here is intimidated. Intimidated. The religious leaders were intimidated as they declared among themselves, just look, the whole world has gone after him. In their minds, their whole world was being rocked, right? So they, their perception was the whole world has gone after Jesus. And we know it wasn't. It was a small part of the world. Their empire was being threatened like never before. And they were to have no part of it. And they were going to tolerate it no more. Jesus represented freedom from their religion for the people. And this completely intimidated them. But before we quickly judge the religious leaders, we need to understand the meaning of the word religion. <coughs> religion is defined by what we can do to earn a blessing or bring favor from God. What we can do. And in our flesh, we tend to do this when we ever so subtly start moving away from grace and into works. Losing our focus on what God has done for us and into what we can do for Him. Our works need to be birthed from what He has done for us. James said it well. It's ours is not a faith and works. It's a faith that works. We may find ourselves serving the Lord with a pure heart, truly, with love and sincerity of heart. But when things are not going the way we expected in our lives, we complain to God. We go to Him that He's not doing His part. Hey, look, God, look at what I'm doing. Look at, I've kept myself pure here and I've, I've stood up for you there and I have faith in this area of my life, Lord. And why, why aren't you answering my prayer here? It's kind of yucky to say that, but that's our nature to move out of grace and into works. Lord, don't you see what I'm doing? You got a pretty good deal here, right? 
We don't say that, but in our heart, I think sometimes it happens. God's not doing His part. After all, God, haven't you noticed how much we've been serving you? And we can become intimidated, afraid of what God's going to do next. Just like the Pharisees, just like the Sadducees, they were afraid of what He was going to do next. The world's gone after Him. It will cause us in our hearts to become intimidated, to become fearful of what our God is going to do to us. Y'all with me on that? Lord, I'll serve you. Just don't send me to the mission field. <laughs> or or we, again, we become very disappointed because he's allowing something in our life that just doesn't make sense, like Job. We become a little nervous, like, okay, what's he going to do next? I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. This is bad, but it could get worse. Rather than going to his heart and saying, God, I don't understand it. I don't have to understand it. You're God. You got me. I got you. We're good. Y'all with me? That's hard to do. And it's real hard to do if we are, have gotten away from our relationship with him and away from, from the word and away from that love that he has for us, the passion that he has for us. So intimidated. Number two, impressed. Impressed. The disciples and the crowd waving the palm branches were impressed, to say the least, right? Right? They were expecting that King Jesus was not only the one who had healed their bodies and so many of their hearts, but also the one who would overthrow the Roman government and finally set Israel free from this oppressive foreign tyrant. But they got it wrong. They were mistaken about this king and his kingdom. He was not arriving on the scene to overthrow Rome's government. He was arriving on the scene to overthrow Satan's government. Big difference. And I wonder if we find ourselves in that same crowd. Our Lord has certainly made an impression in our lives and on our hearts. We have reason to be impressed. But in our awe of Him, we can easily lose sight of how God works and moves in our lives. And this can lead to disappointment as well. Here's what I mean. God has touched our hearts and in many cases healed our bodies. But disappointment comes when God has not answered our prayers in other areas. So in the first case, it's like we're blindsided by what he allows. In this case, it's that we're praying specifically for something, and it's not going like we thought. We simply need to be reminded of what the crowd also needed to understand, that Jesus is a different kind of king, that he doesn't come to take sides. He's come into our lives to take over. He comes into our lives to be an ever-present help in times of trouble. He comes into our lives not only to be our Savior, but also our sustainer. And our relationship with Him is not based on what we can do for, He can do for us, but on what He is to us. He is our Savior, our rock, our shelter, our best friend, our dad. And then there's a third character we see in this story, and that's the one that demonstrates inhabited. Inhabited. The throngs got it wrong. The, the disciples got it wrong. They had seen all these wonderful things. They still, however, expected that they were going to be on his right and on his left when he came into his kingdom, right? Y'all remember that conversation? They wanted to be his royal court. <coughs> the religious leaders got it wrong. Everybody got it wrong. But there's one character in the story that I believe represents where God wants each of us. And the one who did not get it wrong, the one who willingly submitted and was completely available to the authority of the Prince of Peace as he made his way into Jerusalem, was the donkey. <laughs> the donkey got it right. He didn't argue or complain. And his expectations were not out of sync with the plans and purposes of God. Well, yeah, but hang on. The donkey's just a donkey. I mean, what choice did he have, right? He's a beast of burden. He's just a dumb animal. I suspect he wasn't much of a deep thinker. True. But something you need to understand about animals. God has put inside of them something called instinct. 
And this is what God has placed into the animal kingdom to govern them and to help them function properly. It is his authority over the animal kingdom. He put instinct in the animal. That didn't just happen. That's how the animal kingdom is governed. In fact, he put the fear of man in animals. It's in your Bibles. Dominion, right? We, when we fell into sin and were sent out of the presence of God, we lost our precious relationship with our Heavenly Father. But when we were saved, God put inside us something called the Holy Spirit. And this is what God has placed into the human kingdom to govern us and to help us function properly, that we would neither be so impressed with ourselves or intimidated by what our Lord is doing or what He will do in our lives, but rather that we would be inhabited for His glory. And I believe that's the solution to disappointment. We find ourselves with expectations. It's going to happen. We expect things are going to go a certain way in our lives. If we will remember that God is always with us, in us, looking at the world around us, through us, wanting to use us and our hands and our mouths and our feet to tell others about Him, We realize that we are inhabited by the one who put the stars in place. That we're inhabited, that, we, that, that he has come to make our hearts his home. There's not going to be much room for disappointment. Because what happens when we're disappointed is we think he's off somewhere doing something else. That he's lost sight of us. That, that he is forgotten. That he's too busy elsewhere. And we need to just tune in, don't we? To the lover of our souls. I'm right here. It's going to be okay. How many of us have been comforted by our parents? Or how many parents have comforted our children with those words? I'm here. It's going to be okay. I know what I'm doing. And we find peace in those arms. And we find rest. And I believe the rest is where the Lord wants each of us. Yes, we're inhabited. We just need to remember it. Take a lesson from a donkey. <laughs> and surrender. Just be available to all that He is. He knows what he's doing. Amen? Let's all stand and pray. And Lord, we do thank you that you are not only in control, but Lord, you're in our hearts. And you have our hearts. And you love us more than words can say. And so, Lord, I pray you would take these truths plant them into our hearts deeply. That we would not question your heart for us. But we'd always find ourselves back in your arms listening to your still small voice of how much you love us. Because, Lord, if we would get to that place, it really doesn't matter what life brings because we're in your arms. So thank you for that word. Through Jesus we pray. Amen.